Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Mark Burry, CEO and founder of Content Marketing Plaza, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Now, if your breakthrough is to become an influencer who makes money doing what you love, we recently opened up the Advanced Influencer Mastermind, which you can learn more about at contentmarketingplaza.com slash mastermind. We'll throw that in the links in the show notes. But what are we going to talk about in this episode? Well, we have to figure out what drives us to be a successful entrepreneur, to put in all of that work. Because once we can tap into our drive, really, Really amazing things can happen and we have a really special guest today who's going to share with us how we can tap into this drive he is an entrepreneur and best-selling author who runs seminars all around the world where he's training coaches speakers and entrepreneurs on how can they grow their businesses while making a massive impact on their work he founded evolution seminars in 2006 as a way to make an impact in the world through personal development and education he has been trained by tony robbins in the exclusive platinum partnership group filmed in the hit movie the journey with brian tracy and bob proctor and consults with fortune 100 companies his latest book firebox principles helps entrepreneurs tap into their drive that book is at firebox a book.com. Uh, but anyway, today's guest for episode 333 of the Breakthrough Success podcast is none other than Matt Browning. Matt, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Man, Mark, I'm stoked. We've been talking for a few minutes before rolling tape, and uh, I'm happy to be here, ready to jump in with you, dude. Matt, I'm really happy to have you on the Breakthrough Success podcast. I know we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, beforehand, though, I'm wondering if you can share with us. Uh, just a little bit about why you decided to write your book, The Firebox, and uh, just go on this whole journey. Yeah, man. You know, this is my second book, and it's been my first new book in over 10 years. So for me, I've been speaking and training. I put on, I think, almost 300 uh, multi-day events all over the world, 18 cities and four countries. And I love speaking live, and I love coaching live with people. And it took a while. Like, I knew I wanted to do a book. But all of a sudden, something struck me. Um, I started my podcast, uh, The Driven Entrepreneur, a little over a year ago as we were taping this. And as I started interviewing more and more amazing entrepreneurs, just like you're doing, I found that as I asked their story, their stories always came out with this really interesting like superhero story. You know, Every superhero and every villain, for that matter, has, has a, an origin story. And I just kind of got curious. Like I started seeing patterns between the origin stories. So I asked this question, I'm kind of a scientific guy, I guess, you know, I'm a little weird that way. And I thought, man, I wonder like if how many different patterns of stories, like what fuels someone to do what they do. And as I began looking at every entrepreneur I get my hands on, plus, you know, famous people today and, and through the past, I found that there are really only seven different drives. So to me, if you can tap into your story, that's what marketing is, that's what business is today, is story marketing. If you can tap into what your story is, what the passion that drives you, why you do what you do, you'll be able to convey that to your paid team, to your volunteers, and to your clients to be able to connect with you easier, uh, connect with you more. They'll rally around you, you know, whereas you don't have to try to sell to someone anymore. You can instead share your story. So there's all sorts of stories about that, um, and I can tell you what, what the whole thing is in the first place, but that's really why I wrote it. And it's really interesting how you. We, I feel like there are not enough people who are truly tapping into their story. And that's something that is such a valuable resource for us and can really help us. Like when we look back at that story, maybe tap into uh, some of the drive. And I know you've interviewed a lot of people on your show. So based on your experience with all these interviews, uh, what do you believe really leads to becoming a driven entrepreneur? So number one is, is you can't, you can't manufacture it. Right, there always is an incident or an origin story. For me, I was six years old. Never forget this, Mark. I'm standing behind this big oak tree. I'm uh, about to start kindergarten, and I was an older kindergarten kid. And I looked out and I saw all these kids playing. And I just remember distinctly thinking to myself, "Man, I can't go play with those kids." Like I didn't know how to talk to them. Um, I didn't feel like I fit in, and they seemed like they all knew each other. They were playing together. I knew in that moment I had a fatal flaw. I knew I was different. I knew I thought different. 
like they were just, I don't know, like seemed like kids were just being kids. I kind of felt like Stewie from the family guy. You know, I was like thinking too deeply about <laughs> stuff. They were playing in the sandbox and I was wondering why they chose that location for the sandbox and how did they get it in there? Did they use a truck or a crane or, you know, what do they do? And, and I thought about that all the time. I remember listening to Elon Musk recently. He was on in a Joe Rogan's podcast and Elon talked about as a kid being scared that someone was going to take him away because he knew that he was so different than everybody else. And he, he said, I, as a kid, I felt if they found out how I really think, they're going to take me away because I'm not like anyone else. And as a kid, that can be scary. But as a lot of us entrepreneurs do, you know, we start off, my first venture was selling uh, skateboard wheels. They were those big 80s, like vision skateboards. They're really janky ones with the tail on one side and the nose on the other and, and uh, little bumpers on each side. And I sold those wheels four for a dollar. I think that whole summer I made like three bucks. But I always just like saw the impossible, saw the invisible, wanted to make it visible. So, you, you know, you relate to that. And as I looked at it, what it really takes is every one of us has that motivation. So that story, that feeling stayed with me all through high school. It wasn't until I was 22 the day – or five days after I turned 22, I started my first business. And that was the first time I can remember genuinely that people came to rally around me. Mm -hmm. They rallied around my vision because I was the center. I'm the guy who created it, right? And everywhere else in my life for 22 years, I couldn't fit in. But when I created the vision, I had to fit in. And people came in to fit around with me. And I liked that feeling. And, you know, ever since I, I haven't stopped, I, I've, I'm going on 18 years that I've never received a paycheck from anyone else besides myself. And, and man, I, I just wouldn't look back. So I thought, let's tap into what is everyone, everyone's individual origin story. And what's the drive? My first drive, there's seven in the book, but my first drive was what I call the significance drive, the need to be special, important, or, uh, or unique. And a lot of people share the significance drive. People like Rupert Murdoch and the news group, you know, Rupert was, uh, you know, he changed his name actually because he didn't want to be under his father's shadow when he took over his paper in Adelaide, Australia. People like Vince McMahon, who was a WWE, you know, the, the billion dollar wrestling entertainment company. A lot of people think it's like that little pro wrestling, that fake stuff, but it's a billion dollar entertainment company. They do movies. They have action figure deals. It, it's a, a juggernaut. And Vince McMahon is driven by the significance drive. His father was a big promoter in New York, up in the Northeast, and and he was Vince's kid. You know, they called him Vince Jr. To this day, he doesn't want to be called Jr. Think about that. Mm. He says, "I'm not Vince Jr. I'm Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Call me by my middle name. I want to be unique and special. I want to be bigger than that." So, anyway, long story short, there's that was my drive, but everyone will relate to a different drive that fuels them. We don't have to get a drive. A drive finds us for each individual venture, but you need to be able to tap in and find out what it is. Because if you don't, you'll be incongruent and you might go, you know, kind of off the tracks. And I mean, that is just, again, one of those drives that uh, of the seven that are in Matt's book, which again, that link will be in the show notes. But I mean, I do feel like the drive finds us. I mean, that need for significance. I mean, not everyone like feels that. Uh, like we feel to varying degrees, but sometimes it's a really big driver for people, especially depending on what your backstory is. But once we have this drive, like um, it, it could be significance, it could be something else. Uh, how do we truly act on it? Because some people, they have the drive, they maybe they're driven for a week and then they stop. So how can we act on it and stay driven? The first, the first step is always discovery and honesty. Figuring out what it is. What, what I find sometimes is you know, I've coached a lot of people from a lot of cultures around the world, and often somebody wants to be something. So, you know, maybe let's say, let's say someone wants to start a nonprofit and they go, man, I, I want to be this person. I want to create this because of the people. But if they really dig inside, maybe there's a different drive that fuels them. You know, so like, for instance, like, you know, the, the seven drives are you have the significance drive to be important. You have the artisan drive. I think I have the book right here somewhere. The artisan drive because it's beautiful. Steve Jobs, you know, had the artisan drive. He just wanted to create something gorgeous. He wanted to create something that was it was special, you know, that that, uh, that he could really be proud of the the work itself. So you have a lot of artists, singers, graphic artists, uh, people that want to create something for the sake of the beauty of it. You have the world impact drive, which is the need to make a dent in the universe and change something. 
which Steve also has. Um, Elon Musk would certainly share that and several other people. You have the contribution drive, which means it's all about the people. The spiritual drive, which is because your creator said to do it, so you do it. And that's not just for ministries. That's a, There's a lot of people in everyday life or in business that you know, you're know you sitting around, you're praying, you hear God say, start this magazine, uh, get that office space, whatever it is. Uh, my wife and I have certainly had that experience many times. That's how we landed in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Everyone always asks, how did I go from California to Michigan? Uh, God called us out here and I, I pray every day that he'll call me to palm trees again but you know uh <laughs> winter is winter and then the last two are the thrive drive which is you're doing it to get ahead essentially to get to improve your station in life whether it's making money or it's getting out of poverty same drive you're you're doing it to, to you're the damon johns of the world right you're hustling and grinding because you want to get to a better place for you and your family and then my favorite by far is the Avenger Drive. And again, tapping into this, the Avenger Drive wants to take a wrong and make it right. So you see something and you want to fix it. Sometimes it's getting revenge on someone who didn't believe in you. Sometimes it's seeing something that's happening wrong in the industry and saying, I want to make an alternative. So to answer your question, I want to give the kind of the preframe of the seven drives. But to answer your question, what you first must do is get honest with yourself and say, why did I really start this enterprise? Mm. Whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit or a church or, or a community group or whatever, just because it's non-profit doesn't mean it's about the people, right? It could, couldn't it be you know, somewhere, hey, I want to make something special. I want to be important, and I'm going to do it by creating this amazing non-profit that helps people. But get honest that your primary drive was significance, not contribution, mm-hmm. and that's okay. You want and and if that's you, how would you do that differently? Well, maybe you put your face on it. You know, you say I'm going to put my name and my face on the on the charity because I should be the the front runner of this. And what'll happen is everything you say about it will feel a little more congruent. If you think you're a, um, a significance drive, but really you're an Avenger drive. You need to be honest with who you are, why you want to get in, involved in this industry or this enterprise in the first place. Once you know why you're doing it, and I know the next question is usually, well, how the heck do you know? Lucky for me and everyone else, I was my first client. I took my own quiz. Mm-hmm. Uh, I created the Firebox quiz, and you get a Firebox book, as you mentioned. Uh, but it's a free quiz, so I'm not charging for it. And the idea is I want to send this out. I want to get companies and owners taking this quiz and getting their employees or team members to take the quiz. So think about this, Mark. Like the idea is, say I have an organization of 100 people. What if we all take the Firebox quiz, and it's in relationship not to the individual, but how they think the company got started, what they think they're doing in this enterprise? And you'd be shocked when the owner takes it and says, oh, it's contribution, but 90% of the mm-hmm. staff take it and say it's Thrive Drive, and they feel like they're just trying to make a buck. And it's interesting. You got to have a real conversation, don't you? You got to get down and dirty, honest, and say, "Well, hang on a second. I want to do this to help the people. That's why we're doing this business. But a lot of the people around this and all of our team members feel like we're just trying to make sales. So something's got to give. You know, you got to have those honest, raw conversations and, and basically get back on track and do whatever it takes to do that. But to start, you got to figure out which drive is driving you in the beginning." Uh, the, several really great points Matt makes. I mean, you don't want to uh, put up one image of yourself when uh, in reality you're being motivated by something else or if there's a disconnect between which of those drives is the sole drive for a company. And I like how Matt also mentions tapping into the why because I feel like a lot of people like go off track when they forget why they got into uh, their business, into what work they're doing and i think that when people hear like why it's like oh let me think about why they think they have the why in their head like they have some kind of a picture but then like as day to day goes on that why can get murky again or go away and then it's like starting all over so how can we once we do this why exercise because i feel like it's very helpful how do we actually remember that and put it uh in front of ourselves every day So two things you need to decide to do after you know what has been driving you. Number one is if you feel like you're being congruent or incongruent, you need to do one of two things basically. Either change your drive to connect to how your company is or where your organization is today. So Greenpeace is a good example. 
And I think Greenpeace could do really well to read the Firebox book for one. But take the quiz, and they're a great organization that, to me, they started off as the Avenger Drive. There's many different nonprofits. There's many different environmental causes out there, right? But they are clear that the culture of Greenpeace started, has always been taking a wrong and making it right. They're about protest. They're about sign the petition. They're about this company has to stop dumping in the river and so forth and so on. Great things. But it's, a, it's an anger that fuels, right? It's a, it's a stop the evil that has been fueling them. But if you look at if, – if I, if I told that to high-level people in Greenpeace today, they would all disagree with me. Say, no, no, no. That's not what we're about. And I'd say you're right. But that's what people think you're about. That's what the everyday person thinks it's about. You get people, you get young volunteers riled up because the environment is going to, to hell in a handbasket. You got to do something about it. But what are they really about? Well, no, they're actually about let's create supportive future environments. Let's take care of the people, maybe in indigenous areas. Let's take care of these animals. Maybe they're actually more about the contribution drive than we think. So in a Greenpeace example, I like to give tangible examples like this. What I would suggest to them if I sat down you know, with the executives is, listen, you need to take your, your firebox drive and realize that it has been a Avenger drive, but you should change your drive. And once you change your drive and say make it a contribution drive, in an organization that size, you need to roll it out. There's a PR campaign. You need to roll it downhill to everyone on the team to say, hey, this is what you know. Domino's did this well. And they said, hey, people said we taste like cardboard, and that sucks. Who wants to eat cardboard? Here's what we're about today. We have changed our recipe. We've changed our ingredients. Give us a try. It'll be top quality. And they actually acknowledged it and made the change in a public PR campaign. I think we could similarly do the same thing with our fire drives. No one really knew what the the founder of Greenpeace believed in his heart necessarily, right? But if we took it, if we took that same concept – he could say, you know what? We started off this way. We wanted to put an end to A, B, and C. But now we realize there's so much more to this. Here's who we want to be today. Here's what we're about today. And they make this campaign where we explain that we're really about contribution, about the people, the animals, the environment. We want to make a better way. We don't want to stop the bad way. We want to create a better way. And it takes some time to get that out. That's option one, if that makes sense, is change your drive. Option two is align your environment and your company with your original drive. I actually, to be to pull the curtain back, I mean, I, I 100% had this happen to me about two years ago, Mark. Uh, so I've been running seminars and trainings and coaching since 2006. And I started off, man, I was on fire. I, I was 26 years old. I, I abandoned my successful real estate and investing career. I did really well for myself. I was a self-made millionaire by 25 and had $5 million in property. And I just, I abandoned all of it because I had this dream and passion to take care of people. I went to Tony Robbins uh, I, and I saw this possibility to help change people's lives. So everything about me was like, you know what? Boom, that's all I care about. I want to go forward and I want to help change people's lives. And I made very little money. After a couple of years, I started figuring it out and I made that big breakthrough where I was able to earn what I, I believe I deserved. So I made good money, but I also, it was never, I never forgot that it was about changing people's lives, right? And I had to be honest, a couple of years ago, I sat down at the end of the year, huge meeting with the team. And we, at the time, you know, we had um, a handful, probably a dozen people on the, on the team uh, and volunteers and we had, you know, some leadership people, we had a pretty good sized company. And I I looked at everyone and said, I got to repent and apologize. I've gotten off track. I realized that so much of our company meetings, even though, again, do I care about people? Yeah. Did I still care about people? Of course. But our company meetings and the intentions had gotten into, instead of saying, how can we get this NLP program in the hands of more people? How can, how can I help someone to change more habits faster? And what do we need to deliver to do that? Instead of doing that, I started asking questions like, how can we increase webinar conversions? Mm -hmm. How can we you know, give a better invitation that's received? How can we raise the price of a certain program? Or You know what I mean? Like I'm asking automation questions, scaling questions, sales questions. Very good entrepreneur business questions. But I had to get honest and say, I've lost the heartbeat of why the heck we started this in the first place. I, I lost it. So we went back to basics. I stripped it back and said, all that's important. 
But let me let me peel it back. And I went and I did it 365 days in the life of a client. And from minute one, I said, what is it like when they meet us? How can we support them? What nurtures their soul? What nurtures their mind? What do they need? And we came up with a lot of new ideas. You know, people are looking for community. So we added, I added more expenses. <laughs> I added things like I had one of my trainers go in and do a weekly community check-in every single week on our Facebook wow. group to answer questions, you know, and I paid for that. Do we charge extra? No. What I started saying is we're really trying to take care of people and what do they need? Well, they need more community. Okay, well, let's create more community in our program then rather than how can I uh, get myself out of this? How can I automate it, et cetera, et cetera? So again, kind of a long answer to your short question, but in summary, option one is change your drive because it's the wrong drive. Option two is you have the right drive still, but you've gotten off track and you need to get mm -hmm. back onto it and get with the team, get with your clients, get with whoever your base of people are and explain it to them. Show them the book, you know, if this is where you started from. If you don't get the book, I mean, whatever, you know, I don't know, this doesn't exist anywhere else, but take this concept and say, hey, this is what I like to do. Here's what I've been reading this year. Here's what I just did. And here's where I think we are. And let's make this change, roll it out to them and get people you have no idea. I mean, you probably know, Mark, but like people will get on board with you like crazy. When you say, here's my vision and here's my honest, what needs to change, they will love it. It'll be a breath of fresh air. They will not judge you like you think they will. You don't have to be scared of it. There might be one or two people who are angry or something because you finally admitted to it, you know. But the vast majority of people on your team and your clientele are going to say, wow, that's so cool you would do that. I'm behind you 100%. How can I help you to get this vision going? So that's what you do. You call the meeting to decide what's next. And Matt brings up a really great point where if you feel like you are stumbling a little bit, just call yourself out on it. I mean, some people, they really want to hide. They want to place blame. They don't want to take responsibility. But if you do that, people love to see that. So uh, definitely if you feel like you're in some kind of similar situation that Matt was in, uh, be completely open and honest about it because then it can help you uh, definitely go on the right track from there. And speaking of going on the right track, I mean, being driven, it's such an essential part of achieving the success that you're looking for. So I'm wondering if you could share with us, what do you believe holds most people back from being driven and trompreneurs? What a good question. So my mind goes to here. One is if if you're driven but you're not getting results, and it, what, what do you want me to answer? Are you driven but you're not getting results, or are you losing the drive and motivation in the first place? Wow. Kind of what do you mean by that, right? Wow, I mean, both of those. Let's I, turn that back on you. Yeah, I don't know which one to pick. I mean, both of them are like really good. I'd say... I feel like we've been talking about like if you lose your drive or trying to get it. So let's flip it and say if you're driven but you're not getting the results. Okay. So if you're driven but not getting the results, you know, one of the, how many ways could we go about this? Let me start with step number one is um, one of my favorite business mentors of all time. His name is Keith Cunningham. So a little shout out to Keith. Uh, he has a new book called The Road Less Stupid and it's definitely a great read. But one of the things Keith taught me early on uh, was this principle of getting in line and staying in line. So most entrepreneurs get in line, meaning they, they start an enterprise, right? They start something. They get in line, like you're in line at the mall for you know food, and you're 10 people deep. And if you just get in line, and then two people in, you know, you still have eight more in front of you, you go, oh, that, well, you know what? This isn't working. I haven't gotten paid. I'm not getting my results. And you pop to something else. You pop to something else. You'll never get it. It says, if you just get in line and stay in line, right, action trumps desire any day of the week if you like if you take action but it's crappy action it's not that focused and you don't have a crazy high desire but you just did daily habits on your business you're going to get further ahead than someone who's super driven post on instagram how excited they are following gary v you know like you're ready to do this stuff but they don't actually get out every monday morning and do something Action will always trump desire any day of the week. So my number one step, if you're not getting the results, is just look at, just be honest. Look at how much action you're taking. What action are you taking? How often? Uh, how repeated is it? Do you ever do the same steps over and over again? You know, you want to have nice teeth? You got to brush your teeth twice a day, every day, at least. You know, you're not some. You might even keep a toothbrush in your pocket for lunchtime. You know, 
if, if you don't want to have nice teeth, try brushing your teeth for three months and then give up because you're not getting the results and see what happens. Mm. You know, how about, you know, you want to work out like we know it for fitness, we know it for health, but we don't see it for business somehow, especially wow. early on in the entrepreneur quote unquote stage. We think that it's supposed to be more instant than it really is. And it just isn't, you know, I, I think in, we're recording this in 2019. I think there's a lot of the, the art of, of staying and playing the long game is starting to become lost. Yeah. You know, I didn't really like I started in 2006. I, I broke out and started having some financial success in 2008, two years later, two, you know, but for some people today, two years is the eternity. If you wanted to become like an Instagram influencer or you want to get, you know, your podcast, right? And imagine three months in, six months in, you're, oh, I'm not really getting that many downloads. or I'm not getting those results. or I don't get the follows or whatever you think your marker is. I'm going to say, are you kidding me? Like you haven't even been at it at all. Two years, you know, I'm an overnight success over 15 years. It didn't, you know, it wasn't until 2009, 10, even 2015 when I really hit a stride. That's nine years into this thing. And it wouldn't have happened if I went away. So that's the advice, man, is, is get in line, stay in line, mm -hmm. take action over and over again, and, and focus on the habitual actions, not random scattered actions, habitual actions repeated. Now, I want you listening to know, the, just think about the advice that Matt just said. This isn't like the cool advice out there, the like, you know, super shortcut, the super hack. This is just grind. Uh, really stay on that line and understand that it may take a year, it may take more than that uh, to achieve the big goal that you want to achieve. So you definitely have to have that long-term game. I feel like this is something a lot of people know, but I feel like we're in such a scramble now trying to figure out what that short-term option is. How do we get 100,000 downloads in 12 months, which certainly happens to some people, makes for a great article headline, but that is definitely uh, <laughs> not the average at all. So uh, definitely be yeah, We all want to be an article headline, you know? Isn't That'd that what good. it is? Like everyone wants to be that article headline, and yeah. it's like no one wants to be the one who no one hears about until they finally – you know what else too is – talk about breakthrough success it's on your hat. You know, like it's not always that thing. It's not always like underground, underground, underground breakthrough. Sometimes it's just a slow and steady scale up, you know, every day, every month, just scaling. And then there's dips and then there's scaling back up again. And that's just how it is sometimes. And you can't like I can't really look except for once. I can't really look back at my business past and go, oh, yeah, that was my breakthrough or this is when I made it. I mean, I could say this year has been incredible. I look at the last 12 months. I've been all over TV, you know, finally, you know, first time ever. I've never been on TV before, but I was all over TV doing the book tour. I spoke with some of the biggest celebrities. I've had huge names on the podcast. Um, I got my show syndicated on the radio, on Chicago uh, radio, AM and FM. Uh, our podcast hit 100,000 a while back. And like all these things started breaking out, right? But I, I'm not going to say, oh, now I made it because there's still so much more. And it was it was all these relationships and little things at a time, you know, building and building and building. Yeah, I mean that's well said. I mean, when I started breakthrough success, I'd always I would always ask people, uh, so I'd like, what was the moment you achieved your breakthrough, or uh, what was the big breakthrough of your journey? And a lot of people would say, you know, like I haven't achieved my breakthrough, or I've done so many different things, or I mean, it's not like you hit the breakthrough in one day. It's like you just wake up one day you look back and you're like, oh, wow, all the stuff that I did. And now here I am today. It's not one magical day. It's the string of a lot of days and events and sequences that you don't really notice at the time. And then that's how you get your quote unquote breakthrough. Right. Yeah. And you just you keep going at it. You keep going on the mountain. Yep. Can't stop. Won't stop. You know, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Now, you mentioned being uh, habitual, which I definitely like having a lot of habits. Like I learn a lot. I do these interviews. That's one of my habits. So uh, I'm wondering, though, if you could share with us, what are some of your habits that you would consider essential for your success? Well, you know, habit number one. Oh, come on in. Yeah. My son just walked in. Happy birthday, bud. A couple of days oh, ago. Happy birthday. So yeah, I'll be out there in a little bit. You what? Go, you get it? You got it. Hey, we're live on the air. You want to talk? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have another one, but I can come out in a little bit, okay? 
So I was doing homeschool today, this morning, and then we we're hanging out in the afternoon. I'll see you in a little bit. He's doing like an art project right now. So, you know, I mean, and what a perfect timing, right? I love those natural interruptions. <laughs> I'm down in my, in my basement office. Um, but one of the first habits is aligning, and this is more of a macro habit, right? It is aligning your, your business activities with the lifestyle you want. And I think the idea of like freedom business and laptop lifestyle and that sort of thing, I think is thrown around a lot. And that's not what I'm talking about exactly. It's little things like I realized as business increased, I was on the road more and travel more. Mm. So I said, gosh, like I'm away from my family a lot. So I'm right. going into the office um, and then I'm off, you know, for two, three, seven days at a time, depending on what it was or if it was going on tour or something. So number one is, oh, why don't I make the habit of why don't I move and make this home office so now I'm in the basement here so I can be home and in between interviews or in between coaching calls, I can go upstairs, make some food. So that mm-hmm. helps to keep my nutrition up, right? Now I can just pop in and boom, grab, you know, grab a chicken breast or some steak, grab some veggies, heat it up, eat, and I got a good healthy meal that I could have in like 15 minutes. Little habits like that where I set myself up that when I was going into an office every single day, for me, that wasn't working because I'd eat more fast food. I'd, I'd get to the office going, oh, I'm really hungry, and now it's 3.30, oh shoot, I haven't eaten yet. Mm-hmm. And I found myself, if you don't have those little habits going, of even micro habits, where do you put your keys when you get home? That's a good example. Where do you put your keys when you get home? And I guarantee you, if you have a place where you put your keys when you get home, you never lose your keys. If you have that, it's always on that dish. There's always that hook. And every time you come in, you always do it. And here's what, how I found out about those micro habits. So guys, get macro habits are good. Like I decided to align my lifestyle. So I said, I want to work from home. And now when I travel, I don't miss them as much because during the week, I'm with them a lot. I, I cleared my whole schedule. I only do interviews on Wednesdays. I only do mm-hmm. coaching on Fridays. So I stack. That's one of the habits. Uh, I'm sure you probably stack interviews as well. I don't know how, how many interviews you did today, but yeah. you know that's kind of what we do, right? Um, so I stack those things. So Thursday is cleared. So today, this is the only interview I'm doing because this was on your schedule. I'm happy to do that. But on a Thursday, it's in the morning. It's my homeschool day. So I get to spend time with Val and I got to teach him math. We got to walk through science, do an experiment. And that goes a long way. And the habit of like, I, I'll, I'll never tell him, stay out of my recording studio. Daddy's bit. I'm like, no, come in, man. Because hmm. I listen to some of the, my favorite podcasts, you know, when life happens with their dog barks, you know, they tell me about their, about their dog. When their kid comes in, I'm like, oh, I heard their kid for a second. It's like my favorite part of the episode. Hmm. So I just figure, you know what? My lifestyle, you got to know who I am. I love my wife. I love my son. I love mountain climbing. I love helping to lead in our church. I love doing entrepreneurship. And if you know who I am, I, I want my lifestyle to surround my business. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of that, that number one. And I talked about micro habits and if we got time, do we still have time for that? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. I, could, I can break that a little bit. So that's the macro is your lifestyle should be surrounded around your business or your business around your life. Right. Um, the micros are really important. So like if think about anything you have that habitually messes up. So if you're habitually running late to things and you just, you're always a few minutes late or, Oh, you, how many times have you tried to text someone or call them on the way to a meeting that said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I'm about five minutes mm-hmm. out. Traffic was bad. Yeah. If you're that person, first admit it. But number two is you probably don't have a micro habit that supports success. So what is it about that that doesn't work? Excuse me. If you're always losing your keys, what's your habit around your keys? I realized this one when we moved across the country. And I always had in our old house, we had an exact spot on the counter, a little spot. That's where my wife's keys go, my keys go. I left my wallet there. It's like everything was just in that little spot. When we moved, boxes were everywhere, and I didn't have that spot. And I, I didn't think about it logically, right? Consciously. Unconsciously, though, I didn't have a spot. So some days, the keys landed on, uh, at the little, what do they call it? Like the little cubby thing, where, like a coat area by the front door. Sometimes a key landed on the counter or the island of the kitchen, two different places. Sometimes it stayed with me in my pocket because when I walked in the kitchen, I didn't have anywhere to put it. So where does my key land now? Now it's in a pants pocket. It's in my closet on the floor. It's on the floor next to my bed with my pants. It's in the laundry, you know? So you got to get these micro habits. So if you lose your keys, find a spot where your key goes every single time. It's so minor, but it's so important. If you feel like you're not accomplishing a lot, this is small but huge. It'll change your life. Make your bed every morning. Clean your dang room. You know, 
whatever it is, like start, wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do something that is a win. And you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked, man. Like how many people I've said that, you know, oh, they look outside their life and they say, there's so many things I got to fix and so many things I want to do. Nothing's working. My whole life isn't working and my job and you know, all these things. And I go, what does your room look like? Oh, what do you mean? It's probably a mess. They go, oh yeah, I guess it is. Let me see your car. The floorboards are full of Coke cans and Wendy's wrappers. And do you know what I mean? Like, there's these little <clears throat> things that seem like they're unimportant. If you could, if you want to get the big habits nailed down, start with the little ones, right? Clean your dang floorboards in the back seat of your car if you have junk food and, and pop cans and water bottles or whatever. Oh, it's my office. Clean your car. If you can't keep your car clean, you're not going to keep your house clean. You're not going to keep your relationship clean. You're not going to keep your mm-hmm. your career clean. Do the little habits. If you're always late to something, what's your habit for navigation? You know, a, a quick tip I do. So look, I'm showing. If you're on video, you can see my little iPhone here. Um, what I do is now I go in. If I'm going to meet with you tomorrow for coffee or for uh, appointment, I go into the map and I plug in that address. I plug in the address the night before. So one, when it comes in the morning, it's already there as a recent and it's already there as a suggestion. Mm-hmm. Number two, as soon as I wake up in the morning, this is what I do. I used to always be late to everything. So I, in my head, I'd go, oh, it's about half an hour away. Uh, get there at 10. So I want to leave about 930. You know, I would just I, I would kind of do the math in my mind. Now, when I wake up in the morning before my shower, I plug the address into my maps and hit start. I don't wait. I hit start. And then it actually says, arrive, 8.52. And I go, oh, okay. Hey, well, I'm an hour out. So that means I have an hour and eight minutes. And if I want to be early, I have less than that. So I literally like, I'll brush my teeth and I check my phone again. Oh, I have 32 minutes. You know, it'll arrive at 9.32 or 9.20, whatever it is, right? And I actually, so does that make sense? So I use my map app to, to backtrack the time. And it's just a little thing. But it's a little hack and it's a little habit that I install that now whenever I meet, I always put the address in first thing in the morning for my first appointment or wherever I am. If I'm going to meet someone in the afternoon, I'm in the office, I put the address in, I hit start, and I've never been late since. Yeah, I mean, that's a really habit. interesting micro habit. And it really gets to the idea where if you want to get the big ones, uh, master the small habits, as Matt mentioned. Uh, I mean, there's definitely, we should be looking at all those small things we do, and that can help us when we track them to then be able to better track the bigger ones uh, that we are doing. And I know you mentioned the book earlier, The Road Less Stupid. And I'm wondering, in addition to that book, if you know of one other book that you believe would have a positive impact on us. Oh, come on. You got to do another one. That's the one I'm reading right now. <laughs> that is that is my favorite book. Uh, so I, I hate this question because there's so many different genres of books mm-hmm. and so many different kinds. So there's Firebox Principle. The Road Less Stupid, I mean, if I could talk about that, it's about making um, better small decisions, right? And it's just like stop and think. You'll thank me later. Stop and think and you'll do that. Um, the other book, I suppose, you know what? Let me just – two ones. Faith-based, I'll say – the Bible. That's kind of not fair. Uh, but for me, just personally, right? I'm not, I'm not telling you how to live your life or what to believe, but for me, that changed everything. The Bible talks about money and stewardship more than any other topic. Um, they talk about faith a ton, of course, but I actually learned, I took my, my relationship and marriage advice and I said, Oh, Oh, what does he, what does it say in here? Uh, We just started living our marriage that way. And like, it got 10 times better. I looked at finance and said, oh, I started I started budgeting and doing my stewardship of money that way, and it got 10 times better. So I love that. And then as far as mindset goes, there's always you know the classic thing can grow rich. That's one that changed my life as a kid. Or not as a kid. I say as a kid. I was, I was like 19 or 18, so 20 years ago. Um, my first real boss, Ed, gave me Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill, and he stapled a $100 bill to the uh, back page. And he wrote, you know, hey, Matthew, good luck. Um, you know, glad you're here, you know, working with us. And, man, I didn't, I didn't read it. I didn't read it for quite a long time. In fact, I didn't read it until I was desperate, hmm. until I made a ton of money and then lost a ton of money. And I actually went back to that book. I was self a millionaire by 25. By 26, I had lost everything chasing my coaching dream. I didn't hmm. share that story with you, but it's um, pretty crazy. And I found myself basically dead broke, living in my friend's trailer in his driveway and eating Easy Mac, you know, for lunch that I kind of stole from a friend, <laughs> borrowed. 
And, and man, like I didn't have money for food. And I remembered I went into my storage unit that I had one more month on. And I look in all these these boxes of books. And I remembered that Think and Grow Rich had a $100 bill in it. And I had planned on saving it until I finally read the book. And I was going to take that and invest it as my first like you know stock investment or something. And I didn't. I ended up taking the $100 bill and using it to buy food. Mm-hmm. And it was a really low moment. But I said, man, if I'm going to steal this $100 bill and just use it for food, I should probably read the book. And I started reading it, and it was very, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't agree with every single tenant in that book, and I'll mention that here. And I think that's important to know. And no, There's no book or no author, no expert, me, you, everyone included, that's 100% right, um, aside from God. I'll, I'll mention that. But you know, there's no one lesson or one person that's going to be 100% right. So I love to take everything with that grain of salt. So read the book and go, you know, there's going to be a lot of truth and a lot of nuggets in it. And as long as I, uh, as long as I use that, I can apply those nuggets. You know, one of the think and grow rich nuggets is, um, is in chapter two when he says, decide in the exact amount of money you wish to receive and what value will you give to the world in exchange for that. And it's just like, how simple is that? Right. Decide exactly what you want rather than hopefully I'll get more money or something. So I always recommend that book to, to anyone young starting out for mindset. Um, the Road Less Stupid is a really good book. Really, it, it's, it's for someone who's it, – it's for anyone, but to me, it's for someone who's been experienced a little bit. And it's about re-deciding how you make decisions. Matt, thank you for sharing with us that book recommendation. That will be in the show notes, marketbird.com slash E333. Um, we'll also throw in content marketing secrets in there for people who want to learn how to grow and monetize a content brand. But before we wrap up this episode, Matt, I'm wondering if you could share with us one question that you believe we should be asking ourselves more often. One question we should ask ourselves more often. Pretty simple, but it's... Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And it's not just for the big things. I think I ask that question a lot. And most people ask that question for the big, like, what's my purpose in life? Why do I want to do this business? Why do I want to create this charity? You know what I mean? But I, I, I've found that recently, especially, it's even more important to ask it about the tiniest things. Why are you wearing that hat? Is that the best way to add this little brand? I think it's a cool thing. So maybe keep it. But sometimes you go, why? Why do I have the couch there? Why, mm-hmm. why do I get up early to do this? Why do I stay up late to do that? Why, do I, why, did, why did I watch that Netflix show tonight? And the answer might surprise you. The answer might be, you know, I really wanted some time to unwind or spend time with my partner or whatever. And then you can go, cool, time well spent. You know, I'm glad that I took an hour to unwind. But what if you ask that question, why am I watching this? And the answer is, because I'm overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And I just needed to stop. And then you could say, well, gosh, like there's follow-up questions. You know, is there a better way to do that? Is there something more productive I could do? Do I really want to just waste away three hours because I'm burned out? Gosh, you know, that's not going to refuel me. Have you ever done something that's distracting mm-hmm. you? It doesn't really refuel us, right? So if I find myself playing a video game or watching, you know, uh, Netflix or whatever, and I'm not doing it for entertainment value. I'm not doing it because it's joyful to me. I'm doing it because I'm burned out. I'm like, I don't, I don't wake, I don't finish three hours of that and feel more fulfilled. So I stop in the middle and go, you know what? That's not what I want to do. What can I do right now? That's even more fulfilling. So then you pick up a good book or you go write something or you go exercise or whatever it is. Right. Does that make sense? So Mm -hmm. yeah, ask every single thing, the tiniest things, why am I doing this? Matt, that is a really awesome question and an analysis of that question. And I mean, you shared a lot of really awesome insights throughout our time together. Um, again, the show notes will be marketbrady.com slash E333. We encourage all listeners to join us in the Facebook group at contentmarketingplaza.com slash Facebook to interact with other listeners. But Matt, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all of your great insights with us. And don't forget, uh, listeners, to check out Matt's book. Uh, that book again is over at the link fireboxbook.com but I definitely want to thank you again for being on the show sure appreciate it Mark and I'm always on social media as both of us are at Matt Browning if you want to follow me on Instagram or you know Twitter Facebook whatever super fun to be there I always put on a ton of um, 
you know, family pictures and mountaineering stuff and, you know, TV appearances and just, you know, all different leadership memes. You know what I'm saying, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to keep up with me, I'm very active there and always, uh, always happy to hear from everyone, you know. So ask questions, man. Love to. 